Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Stanley Wu, and I am the coordinator for Omega and the director of the Resilience Project. Omega is a collaborative, collaborative working on the global poly crisis and includes the Millennium Alliance for Humanity in the Biosphere at Stanford, the Kranz Foresight Analysis Nexus, or FAN Initiative, and the Resilience Project. We're delighted to be joined by Dr. Tatsuhiro Suzuki, who is a world leader in nuclear power plant safety, nuclear proliferation, and the abolition of nuclear weapons. After a brief presentation from Dr. Suzuki and a quick introduction from Joan Diamond, this conversation will be facilitated by Michael Lerner, who will lead us through a few questions in a conversation. Now, without further ado, we'll hand it over to Joan Diamond. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stanley, and thank you, Tatsu. So our guest today has that rare skill and knowledge to confront nuclear issues from small but powerful technical and analytic detail to the broad existential implications and complexity of those issues. In our case, the issues are the vulnerability of nuclear power plants during war and the threat of nuclear war. Our speaker is a world expert in understanding nuclear safety in power plants from war, their design, age, accidents, and terrorism. And I probably forgot some of the other perspectives and windows. At the same time, he is a global voice on nuclear security and abolition and understands the dynamics of the possible use of nuclear weapons. Today, the invasion of the Ukraine brings back into focus the threat of nuclear release from an attack, accidental or deliberate, on a nuclear power plant as well as the threat of tactical or strategic use of nuclear weapons. To guide us in understanding the current nuclear threat, we are honored to have Dr. Tatsujihiro Suzuki, who will take us through three issues, nuclear threat and risk of nuclear weapon use, nuclear power plant safety, and how to reduce nuclear risks in the middle of the crisis. When reflecting on Tatsu's career, I realized that he is one of those rare leaders who has actually worked operationally on the ground, in academia, and in top government policy roles. So the full spectrum um, of these issues. Dr. Suzuki currently serves as both the vice director and a professor of the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition in Nagasaki uh, University, RECNA. Every day in Nagasaki, he is reminded firsthand of the horrors of nuclear war. He is also the former vice chairman of the Japan Atomic Energy Commission. Prior to joining RECNA, Suzuki served as an associate vice president of the Central Research Institute of Electric Power Industry in Japan, was a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy, the University of Tokyo, an associate director for many years of MIT's International Program on Enhanced Nuclear Power Safety, and a research associate at MIT's Center for International Studies. He is also a member of the Executive Committee and Council of Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. For those who are not familiar with Pugwash, it is a leading international organization aiming to develop and support the use of scientific, evidence-based policymaking, focusing on areas where nuclear and weapons of mass destruction risks are present. It is with great pleasure that I turn the meeting over to Dr. Suzuki. Thank you, Tatsu. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh... Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I would like to make a start a presentation soon. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Yes, sir. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, so I like to uh, talk about the uh, imminent risks we face because of the Ukraine invasion. But even before the Ukraine invasion. I was actually concerned about the status of uh, nuclear weapons situation right now. It is very serious. Now it's much more serious now because of the invasion. There are four points, uh, five points here today. Uh, first, even before the Ukrainian crisis, the so-called doomsday clock is the worst situation uh, after the end of World War II. And so this is a very even before the Ukraine crisis, we are under very strong stress 
regarding the nuclear weapon risks. And then the Ukraine invasion happened. And uh, uh, even just the nuclear threat or attacking the nuclear power plants were against international law and must be stopped. This is very, very serious situation right now. And the situation in Ukraine, uh, this is very unique. Ukraine doesn't have much natural resources. So they depend on nuclear power. 50%, more than 50% of electricity come from nuclear power. And they import natural gas from Russia. So their dependence in terms of energy dependence, this is also a serious situation. And that attacking and occupying Chernobyl site and the Polja nuclear power plant, this is already very serious. I never expected that could happen also. And potential nuclear risk posed by this uh, attacking nuclear power plants, there are several uh, which I'd like to mention. First of all, already happened power loss. You need power, always you need the power to cool the power plant, cool the nuclear fuel. So uh, uh, power loss uh, will immediately, we are concerned that uh, it will lead to the meltdown. And even just the whole safety system, of course, depend on the power. So power loss is the most serious concern we have. And then just the damaging safety system, uh, also serious concern. And, and also loss of communication with the site and the loss of uh, losing all the equipment to measure uh, the whole safety systems. And also uh, international safeguard system uh, could be lost and they, you cannot track the nuclear uh, materials in the region. And finally, the uh, operators uh, situations, uh, fatigue, stress, and they could lead to the mistakes and uh, um, lots of control over the safety system. So those are just the four points I'd like to raise the seriousness of this current situations. Finally, whether Putin will uh, push the nuclear button is a concern. And we, we read, uh, if you read the uh, uh, statements or his statements and the nuclear strategies they published two years ago, it, he could, he could push the button. This is a very serious situation right now. So we have to do our best to avoid nuclear war at this moment. Okay, this is the Doom's Red Clock. And you can see since 1947, as you can see, 1953, this is a, a hydrogen test uh, called, this is the worst case. And then after 2020, uh, 100 seconds, even, even worse than the 1953, because of this list of events that the uh, uh, Bretton Autumn scientists uh, raised uh, since 2020. And uh, uh, we will probably we have to add Ukraine crisis next year. And it could probably worse than 100 seconds from now. And this is the poster we publish every year, uh, Reckoner published every year, the, the number of nuclear warheads in world, uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, Compared with 2013, which we started, uh, it is the number has been decreased. But if you look at the contents of the uh, decrease, 80%, uh, more than 80% of the decrease happened on, on the retired nuclear weapons. And it's uh, deployed and stored only 14%. Actually, just last year, actually deployed and stored actually increased. So basically the, uh, uh, the pace of uh, uh, nuclear disarmament is basically stalled, actually reversing the trend right now, because of basically two, two major event, uh, trends that I like to focus on, modernization of nuclear weapons and development of advanced missiles, because the number, even number of decrease, the, uh, the risk of nuclear weapons actually increasing. The left-hand side, this is the uh, smart nuclear weapon developed by the United States, even uh, before the Trump and Obama administration started. Obama administration tried to reduce the number of nuclear weapons, but to maintain the effectiveness of nuclear deterrence. So this is smarter nuclear weapon is, it, the warhead can vary the, uh, the power of the nuclear weapons. And the same size, smaller means it's not necessarily, the size is small, but the, the yield is smaller, but it's the, uh, the size is same. And this rotating, uh, 
have a wheel, it can manipulate the maneuver, uh, and then there's a computer is inside, so it can track the target smartly. So it's basically more accurate and uh, it can very flexible nuclear weapons. And it, it already at that time, it raises the issue of the smarter nuclear weapon can be more easily used because people think this is much smaller yield and also uh, it can precisely attack the target. The Russian uh, response is this avant-garde, uh, it is a uh, uh, hypersonic missiles. You can, they can also maneuver and then evade missile defense and it can reach the United States less than 10 minutes probably or so. It's very fast, much, much faster than the uh, ICBM. So this is basically those weapons will uh, destabilize uh, the nuclear uh, balance. And also the new technology, cyber warfare. Uh, this is a report published by uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative 2017. And the CIPRI uh, issued the report 2019, 2020, the impact of AI introducing nuclear weapons. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but basically the, the message is that the uh, AI and the cyber technologies uh, has to be included in the system because it will improve, it's supposed to improve the, the safety of the nuclear weapon system. But at the same time, it could make it more vulnerable to the foreign attack. And also uh, the liability could be uh, misleading because AI disability is not so high yet. So basically the, the, the report itself is basically warning that uh, uh, these new technologies could also destabilize the, the nuclear balance. So this is what we are concerned before uh, the Ukrainian crisis. So it's already very serious. Okay, let's go to the nuclear uh, power in the Ukraine. There are uh, 50 nuclear power plants, and you see this is a north uh, area. It's very close to the border of Belarus, and this is the south. Uh, already war is happening in those areas, so it's very close to, to the nuclear power plants. And those two power plants, the Poja uh, nuclear power plant site, two are operating at this moment. And this is the approach of nuclear power plants. You can see the river, uh, the beautiful scene, and uh, six units total, close to nine, uh, six gigawatts. This is the, uh, one of the largest uh, nuclear power plant sites. Uh, in Japan, the two, seven, seven units and six, this is the largest one, Kashiwate Karia. In Europe, the Fr French, uh, Grabani line, I think I cannot pronounce it, <laughs> but anyway, this is the uh, second largest in Europe. But the point is here is it's a huge, huge amount of nuclear materials on the site. So this is a serious situation already. This is a Russian PWR, which is a little bit different from uh, uh, Western PWR. And but safety has been improved uh, after the Chernobyl accident. And you can see, uh, see, let's go to the stress. I, I read this report in 2015 after the Fukushima accident, they had a stress test and basically they have improved the safety quite significantly. And if you read this report, some, somewhat assured that, that they have improved the safety very well. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but, but this is stress test uh, report is very useful. Uh, but however, if the military action happened and attacking nuclear power plants, all these safety tests doesn't mean much. The safety system could be broken very easily. And if you see this list of uh, uh, actions by the Russian military, I wouldn't say this is accidental. Uh, this is basically planned or intentional attack. So this is very serious. Um, although at this moment, Fortunately, no radiological uh, impact, uh, no serious release from the site, but it could happen at any time. This video analysis by National Public Radio uh, in the United States looked very serious. Uh, we thought that the, uh, only the training center was attacked at this uh, uh, Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant, but the video showed no, uh, they have 
they attacked other places, even the reactor building itself. This is very serious. It could have caused serious nuclear accident during the attack. They also attacked the power lines. And the problem here is they show very small portable heavy armor, RPG. If, you, if, you, if that's the case, uh, I am concerned that the very heavy armed terrorist groups could also attack and occupy the plant. We cannot defend, we cannot defend. That's a problem. And uh, uh, it could uh, penetrate the contaminated vessel, uh, then destroy the coal. This is very serious. <laughs> and the power loss at Chernobyl site. Uh, fortunately, that uh, the power has been recovered. I think it, this morning they, they may have a loss again, but I'm not sure. Uh, but fortunately, the IAEA said that the status of the plant is relatively okay. There's no imminent radiological risk because of the spent fuel pool. Uh, spent fuel is cool enough so that there's even uh, without power, it could stay safe. But uh, uh, the problem is the IAEA said basically communication loss. There's no communication. And also the, the status of the operators. They are concerned about the status of operators. But I thought that there was a, uh, I had a, some, uh, I, I participated in one webinar that the Ukrainian nuclear uh, safety expert uh, mentioned that, that this is still a serious situation. I, I wasn't sure what was the problem. And she didn't tell us because she said that it was a confidential report. So I didn't know what it was, but uh, this paper showed the, the pond, cooling pond near the power plant and uh, there's a damaged nuclear materials here, the bottom of the uh, pond. And this has to be, uh, this water has to be uh, pumped up from the uh, downstream river. The water can, this, this water could lead to, leak to, to the river. So the, the, if the power loss, uh, this pump will not uh, operate, it can be operated. So, so the water will be, evaporate and eventually this radioactive material could release to the to the to the air so if i don't know how long uh this this could sustain the uh, water evaporation but um, this could be a serious problem because the huge amount of radioactive materials is at the bottom of this cooling pond so this may be another serious concern and uh, so uh as to some that the Risk of nuclear uh, power plants. <clears throat> the 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 point is is that the, the amount of radioactive materials, nuclear materials at the nuclear power plants is massive, huge, and more than more than nuclear weapons. And also for from nuclear power plants, uh, the uh, amount of long life nuclear materials are much bigger than the nuclear weapons uh, fallout. For instance, cesium 137, this is a problem still remains in the Chernobyl and also Fukushima. The amount of Fukushima uh, from accident, but compared with the Hiroshima bomb, about 170 times. And this is only 1%, 3% of material coming from out of the Fukushima nuclear accident. So if the nuclear um, release happened at the, the power plant, the release of the nuclear materials, particularly long life nuclear materials could be much, much larger than the nuclear bombs. So I already talked about the possible risk. And so basically nuclear safety system are not effective. You cannot protect by the meter actions. And this is a additional protocol, uh, the Geneva Convention. And if you read this article 56, all these action happening right now are against this international law and humanitarian law basically. And uh, Russia ratified this uh, protocol. So uh, this is already serious violation of this law. Okay, the nuclear risk. This is Putin's statement on nuclear threat. Uh, just uh, probably you have seen this one from February 27th. And, uh, but so far, they raised the uh, status, uh, a lot status of the strategic nuclear weapons, but not. Uh, other uh, part of the nuclear weapon forces. The more we are more concerned at this moment is 
so-called tactical nuclear weapons, which could be used against Ukraine or NATO. Uh, so uh, still restrained uh, at this moment. And fortunately also NATO and uh, uh, President Biden is also very restrained at this moment. So it's still balanced and still the status is very quiet at this moment of the nuclear situation. However, if you read the statement uh, of the Putin and also the uh, nuclear strategy published by Russia in 2020, it is serious situation. If you see the July 2020 statement, uh, in the case of aggression against the Russian Federation with the use of conventional weapon, conventional weapon, when the very existence of the state is put under threat, they are willing to use nuclear weapons. And then he said February 24th, it is not only a very threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and its sovereignty. It's very close to the sentence used in the 2020 nuclear strategy. So if you read his statement, Putin may be willing to use nuclear weapons. And uh, uh, just by coincidence, last year, this year actually, this past year, Lekuna uh, studied the uh, possible nuclear weapon use in Northeast Asia. And 25 cases we listed, if you are interested, please download from this site. And the, the lessons from this uh, study is that uh, we thought that uh, more accidental, unintended use of nuclear weapons is imminent, but this is in, this could happen intentionally. And the problem is here the the case also suggests that the, even if it's intended to for the limited nuclear weapons war, limited nuclear war, the future after the nuclear weapon is used, you never know what's going to happen. Also, it depends on the personality of the leader. Uh, it could go very well. It could end the war and lead to the negotiation, lead to the to the um, peaceful negotiation again. But it could lead to the escalation and the end of world war. I mean, the, the end of uh, uh, nuclear. I mean, the, the lead to the nuclear war, global nuclear war. So this study was uh, already scare, uh, scaring for for us, but. Uh, under the district invasion, uh, unfortunately, uh, this report was uh, becoming a reality, is becoming a reality. Uh, thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzuki. That's a sobering and extraordinary presentation. I want to encourage all of you who have questions to please put them in the chat. Uh, I will have questions, but uh, let me start with one from the chat from Robert Isaacson. Does Russia have neutron weapons? I don't think so. Uh, it used to have both the United States and the Russia, mm -hmm. but I think they, they, they uh, stopped it. Mm -hmm. While we were chatting before we all came on, uh, I, I asked you how serious you considered the situation, and you said, extremely serious, you said, perhaps the worst since the Cuban Missile Crisis. That, that's accurate? Yes, I think it's, uh, fortunately, it's not, worse, not, <laughs> not bad as the Cuban crisis, mm -hmm. but it's probably uh, uh, more, more serious than the uh, North Korean crisis in 2017 that uh, President Putin and uh, Kim Jong-un started to fight over uh, verbally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were concerned very, at that time also, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, Korean War could be imminent. Mm -hmm. Your description is very sobering of the danger of uh, a meltdown at one of the big uh, Ukraine nuclear power plants. Uh, if there was a meltdown, a serious meltdown, uh, when you talk about how much nuclear material is, how, how dangerous that material is, uh, what would actually happen in terms of the distribution of radiation? What do we know about wind patterns? Just I'm, I'm, I'm naive about this. I remember what happened after Chernobyl. But what would happen if there was a major meltdown in terms of uh, the, the distribution and the health impacts? As I can show, uh, this 
uh, the Poja power plant is uh, bigger than the Fukushima. Yeah. The roughly 10 times of the Chernobyl power plant. So uh, uh, if all nuclear reactors uh, had a radioactive release, it's about 10 times serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is that the six units, the lesson from Fukushima is that if one unit uh, cause a uh, uh, meltdown, uh, the operators cannot control uh, the next plant because you cannot access to the site. So it could lead to the all meltdown, and that will happen in the Fukushima case. Once the unit one had the explosion, hydrogen explosion, it is difficult for them to control number two, number three. So all three units had a meltdown. This could happen to this, you know, uh, the Poja. So even just one power plant, one, one unit uh, causes meltdown, it could lead to chain reaction. That's, that's my concern. Uh, is there a, a direction of wind or, or is there a general sense of how the radioactive cloud would distribute itself over time? How would that play out? Yes. The wind direction is very, very important. And uh, unlike nuclear bomb, nuclear bomb is radiation goes, you know, the circle. But the uh, nuclear power plant case, uh, it goes in the, in the uh, wind direction and also rain. Mm -hmm. If it rains or snows, the uh, order rate of go, goes down. So if you look at the Fukushima uh, evacuation uh, map, it's northwest wind, and then it, it snowed at that time, March uh, 14th or 13th. Mm -hmm. And uh, it actually, it, you know, wind direction changes all the time. And uh, uh, some of the uh, time, the cloud went to Tokyo area also, but it didn't rain. So it didn't go down much. Mm -hmm. So the wind direction and the rain or snow could be a serious, you know, could mm -hmm. big uh, factors. And how does how does the radiation distribute globally over time, given uh, differing wind uh, conditions? In other words, is it does it distribute fairly equally, and over what period of time does it distribute? Well, it depends also the height of the uh, crowd also. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think eventually, you know, even the small amount of radioactive material could lead to the wider area. And, uh, but uh, uh, the amount, again, it depends on rain and the snow. And also uh, uh, time, in terms of time, it's probably could take a month to reach uh, the global area. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Joan Diamond reminds us that we had a conversation of the danger of fear and long-term mental health impacts of Fukushima. And before we came online, I, I mentioned to you that I watched an interview you did with the Atomic Heritage Foundation with an interviewer uh, who was quite pro-nuclear from what I could tell. Uh, and you gave a very nuanced response that with Fukushima, that the actual health dangers were less than many people thought, but that the uh, psychological and social impact was immense and that Fukushima had basically changed your whole approach as a nuclear engineer to calculating risk and consequence. Uh, how does that play out in the situation that we are looking at here? Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you describe this as extremely serious. Um, how does that combination of the psychological and social consequences play out vis-a-vis uh, -vis actual health risks? Well, first of all, the Fukushima case, the amount of radioactive active material released to the environment is about one-tenth of Chernobyl. And, uh, uh, and also people evacuated much faster than the Chernobyl case. So that's why I said that the radiation risk is probably smaller, mm -hmm. but still uh, we, have to look, we have to be careful about uh, uh, 
impact. Uh, titled cancer cases increasing in the Fukushima area for children. But in any case, um, the, the fact that uh, if you are uh, affected um, residents, you, you will be concerned. You never yeah. know when, when the cancer will happen to you. So the psychological stress is much, much more uh, than the uh, um, actual health impact. Mm -hmm. And also people evacuated, they, they left the house, they left their home any, without any warning at all. So they left everything left in your house, home. Mm -hmm. And all the, all the oh, I, I cannot, but basically they, they changed, this accident changed your life completely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, um, they still cannot go back. Mm -hmm. Only two or three percent of the uh, uh, people who, who uh, they are now allowed to co come back, but they haven't come back. Mm -hmm. And it is you, mentioned, it is you mentioned cancer risk, but aren't there a wide range of other risks? And what are the uh, genetic risks over time uh, to? Uh, survivors of nuclear uh, effects what in terms of later generations well at, at this moment there have not been any so-called genetic disease caused by the radiation to the next generation and uh, but uh, again we have to we have to go keep on working to to make sure that's the case but uh, uh, the disease as you said uh, there are different kinds of cancers and uh, even, even 77 years after the uh, bombing, the new disease is coming up from the hibakushas. So it, 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 this is a very humanitarian impact. It is, you, you cannot eliminate, you, you never be assured you are safe against the radiation risk. That's the problem. Hibakusha always, have, you have to be concerned about the, your, your health mm -hmm. all the time all the time, mm -hmm. and that, that's very serious. One of our listeners, and by the way, I really want to encourage people to add your questions. They're very thoughtful questions. Uh, uh, Joe Andrade says, what can you say about the nuclear decision hierarchy under Mr. Putin? Um, I don't know much about the Russian uh, situation, but uh, if you, probably the system is similar to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I don't think just one person can push the button. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the uh, of course, system, political system is different. Putin is much more powerful than the American president. And uh, I don't know how many people could actually uh, persuade Putin not to push the button. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, uh, even the Trump can push the bottom, but it is possible that uh, other people could restrain the whole whole nuclear uh, weapon system. But I don't know. Uh, and also, there was a, a concern that, uh, that Russia may have developed the so-called automatic response uh, system and uh, without human involvement mm -hmm. and so-called doomsday machine. And uh, uh, so e even just the misunderstanding of the uh, NATO's or US behavior could trigger Mm -hmm. those uh, uh, automatic response mm -hmm. systems. Ross Brockwell asked about the possibility of global nuclear war. Does Russia's hypersonic delivery capability represent a significant enough advantage for them at this point that they might be tempted to use it while they have it, especially if their leadership actually feels the existence of their state is presently at risk? I, I, again, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't think the Putin will uh, preemptive strike against the whole United States at this moment. There is no such rationale for doing that. If Putin will use nuclear weapons, it's probably only the tactical nuclear weapons against NATO or uh, uh, possibly in Ukraine. But I, again, there's no strategic reason for doing it at this moment, mm -hmm. assuming he's rational. Mm -hmm. and so basically he's threatening uh, cohesion, so-called cohesion, and forcing other, other uh, opponents to, to obey his, his uh, 
policy. Mm. And, but uh, again, the, our study of the Northeast Asian case suggests that uh, depends on the psychological status of the uh, uh, leader. Mm -hmm. Any change of the other party's behavior could trigger uh, the nuclear uh, war. Uh, that's our concern. And any signals the United States or NATO could trigger that Putin, oh, we are, I'm threatened, I should push the button. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my we're, concern. We're getting so many good questions. Our, our colleague Asher Miller from the Post Carbon Institute says, I've not seen much discussion about the assumptions that underlie nuclear power of long-term uh, social stability, including the ability to maintain electricity and have access to fresh water constantly. How much is the possibility of societal collapse or drought factored into conversations you are aware of? And even if existing power plants are shut down, how long uh, do spent rods have to be have to be cooled? So that's a critical question I was wondering about too, because in your slides, uh, and we've talked with Joan Diamond about this at some length. Uh, you know, if the electric grid gets shut down and it's needed for cooling, a lot of the generators have what a few weeks of uh, of, of of ordinary fuels, and then so. Uh, I guess my question uh, coming out of Asher's question is, how concerned should we be about the power grid going down and the current status of, uh, of cooling, emergency cooling, uh, if the power grid doesn't get back up in time? Basically, the, uh, uh, after the Fukushima accident, uh, as I show the stress test, yeah. Uh, the uh, safety uh, emergency power system should sustain at least seven days. That's a world world basically uh, standard. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Chernobyl case, also, I mean the uh, Ukrainian case, also uh, that satisfy the situation. And Chernobyl site only said 48, 48 hours, which is which is two days. That's not enough. And uh, uh, but that because uh, Chernobyl power plant had already shut down, everything shut down. So I think maybe two days is good enough but basically so seven days only seven days okay we assume power grid could come back in the, within seven days in japanese mm -hmm. case before fukushima only three days uh and then people assume we assume that uh, under the normal conditions three days is good enough to recover the public uh, power power so during the war all these assumptions could be meaningless Seven days is not no long enough for for ending the war. That's why I said the war under the war situation you cannot protect the power plant, nuclear power plant. So this is a very serious situation. I'm going to read several comments together, and you can respond as you wish. One was, uh, "How has Japan's agricultural and food security changed since Fukushima?" Mm -hmm. uh, a second from uh, Leslie Mihan. This is terrifying information, I'm taking it in. Is there any government or scientific strategy being developed to protect the plants from further attacks during this invasion? And Robert Isaacson writes, and this is a wonderful question. In addition to potassium iodine, are there any other prophylactic nutritional supplements you would recommend to mitigate radiation exposure? And I, I wanted to ask on that final point, um, you know, uh, these potassium iodine, at least right now, is widely available and inexpensive. Uh, given what we're facing, to what degree should individuals, schools, and others uh, try to stock up on it while it is available? And is it useful for adults as well as children? Okay, the first question is food um, contamination. Yeah. Um, we currently, even even after uh, 11 years, uh, all Fukushima agricultural products go through the uh, radiation check. Only 0.3% of the food are now beyond the regulatory limits. So once it is found, the uh, uh, those food 
cannot go into the market. Uh, so at this moment, uh, I would say uh, all the agricultural products from Fukushima to the market is very, very safe because mm -hmm. any other prefectures is doing the similar test, only Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if Tokyo, for instance, did the same thing, I would say 0.3% is probably a uh, kind of margin of error. Mm -hmm. So you could find some similar uh, uh, food that could be contaminated higher than the uh, radiation limits. So mm -hmm. I would say food contamination is now it's becoming much less serious concern mm -hmm. for us. Second question was the uh, strategy against military attack. Yeah, are, are strategies being developed to protect the plants? No. That's, I cannot think of anything yeah. against the military attack. Yeah. You have to just stop it. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, yeah, it is very difficult. Um, and what about the question of anything in addition to potassium iodine? And my additional question, uh, is it useful for adults as well as children? I think main concern is children. Yeah. Um, so I would, I would say the priority should go to the children. Uh, they are mm -hmm. much more uh, uh, vulnerable to the radiation risk. So I, I, I don't know what uh, any other uh, uh, medicine or uh, mm -hmm. isotopes could be. Uh, you, you, you can eat probably uh, uh, seaweed. <laughs> well, I mean, I've read, I've read about seaweed. Is that serious or not? Yes, it is. I, we eat seaweed very well. I saw. So mm -hmm. if you don't have any iodine, uh, 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 eat, eat seaweed. Okay. That's, and that's don't eat the mushroom. Mushroom contains concentration yeah. of uh, radioactive materials. Mushroom is very high. I want to come back to Asher Miller's uh, question because he is a, a serious expert on the global poly crisis. So, um, so the question really is about uh, the possibility of societal collapse mm -hmm. and drought. Uh, and whether you're aware of whether this is being factored into the conversations. So if, if there, I mean, just from what you've seen in Fukushima and what you've seen in the global literature, if, if uh, one of the big plants goes critical and, uh, and uh, releases a lot of radiation, what would you anticipate would happen uh, in the surrounding area, in Europe, what do we know about what happens societally in a, in a poly crisis situation where everything is connected? What is your sense of what we would likely see? Well, uh, at least uh, psychological and uh, also economic uh, impact is quite significant. Mm -hmm. You have to probably uh, monitor the radioactivity uh, around the globe and also monitor the food uh, coming from probably the region, uh, in this case, Ukraine and Europe, uh, at, at least for probably a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's more economic, uh, psychological impact. And uh, of course, how many, I don't know how, what other area, what area could be uh, forbidden to, mm. to live for at least for probably 30 years or more, even more. And I just don't know, uh, um, but that's what probably, I don't know how many people will be affected in terms of uh, health impact. And, mm -hmm. uh, in the Fukushima case, after 11 years, no immediate, no, I would say no uh, fatality at this moment caused by the radiation, uh, mm -hmm. by Fukushima accident. So it's a, it's a fortunate, but uh, more than 2,000 people, or I think 3,000 people, so called accident related to death, which means uh, psychological uh, stress. Mm -hmm. And people moved from uh, away from home, and because of the stress, people uh, caused you know the caused that serious illness. And uh, uh, so, 
those who indirect impact of the accident could be also serious. But I would say uh, energy policy in Japan has completely uh, changed and uh, people's perception of nuclear power also completely changed. Now it's almost 60% of the public wants to phase out nuclear power before basically reverse. Uh, I would say at that time, before, before Fukushima, 60% of public wants to maintain nuclear power. So, so that kind of impact could happen. Uh, In your interview with the Atomic Heritage Foundation, you spoke very movingly about, you said if you were to take one word uh, for what, um, what was critical, it was trust between the people and the government and industry. And that once trust has been broken, it's extremely difficult to repair. And even though the government had made technical changes, it had not made the kinds of behavioral changes that were necessary to, uh, to uh, bring trust back. Yeah, that, that's still happening in Japan. I, I don't think we have recovered the trust yeah, yeah. Uh, with the government, particularly in the nuclear area. Uh, mm. So that's why people don't, even the restarting of the existing nuclear power plants is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, Joan Diamond says, you have mentioned that there aren't shortcuts. We have to prevent use of nuclear weapons and damage to power plants. How do we do that? Do we have any agent, agency in preventing the dark scenarios? I cannot think of any. I think, first of all, uh, we have to restore the communication from the plant and the IAEA. That's the only route we have uh, to, to get to know what's happening in, on site. And uh, right now, IAEA don't have, I don't think that they, they don't have any direct impact, communication with the power plant, mm -hmm. uh, the Poja and the Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. um, that's a concern, first of all. If if they recover the communication, and if Russia allow IAEA to come down to the site, that will be very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, it doesn't seem like, and uh, because Russian military occupied, they say they they already uh, own the power plant, mm -hmm. and if that's the case, they are out of international safeguards. They can take out spent fuel anywhere they want. And uh, um, so, first of all, I think Russian military forces should return the control of the power plant to the Ukrainian government, and so that uh, they can control the nuclear power plant safely. Mm -hmm. uh, Sher Miller uh, uh, continues uh, to clarify the question, which I may have misstated a bit. Uh, my question was less about a single nuclear power plant going off and more about the mindset of proponents of nuclear power, including those who see it as a solution to the climate crisis. But it seems like there's an unspoken assumption built in that our societies will remain stable enough to maintain them long-term. That's correct. <laughs> Global yeah. nuclear power plants, four, uh, close to 400 nuclear power plants. We are operating all these plants under the assumption there will be no war, no attack, except that the nuclear terrorism we are concerned already, but not no uh, no war. That that's what we agreed in 1949. Mm -hmm. there, there will be no attack against nuclear facilities, even during the war. Mm. Same like a dam, also dam and the nuclear power plants and other uh, area, for instance, biological facilities, for instance, laboratories. All these things should, should be excluded from the military attack. Now it's no longer the case, it's Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, United Nations Security Council uh, permanent member mm -hmm. is attacking nuclear facility. This is, this is not uh, unexcusable, this is unacceptable. Our colleague, Dick Jackson, who was very senior at the Centers for Disease Control and longtime friend in, in, in this research writes, 
Persons with iodine deficiency in areas like Ukraine have low iodine diets. I see. When, when I was at CDC, you, the, uh, 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 we worked hard to get those areas to iodinate uh, table salt, which worked well to reduce high air, rates of iodine deficient goiter and to help protect infants from iodine deficient hypothyroidism, which can result in lifetime retardation. Pregnant women and children absorb much more dietary iodine than do adults. So Dick, thank you for that. Uh, Joan Diamond uh, uh, went on to ask you, are people in Japan willing to reduce energy consumption as one pathway to reducing dependence on nuclear power? We have, we have done that uh, right after the Fukushima accident. Uh, in one year, electricity consumption dropped, uh, peak, peak demand dropped up roughly 20%. That, huh. That's un unconceivable, but it's coming back very quickly. Uh, huh. Right now, uh, just basically, but electricity consumption has been declining gradually because not, not because of the behavior itself, but also the efficiency of the uh, system mm -hmm. uh, improved quite significantly. And also uh, uh, industrial structure will change probably in, in Japan. So I would say electricity consumption will not grow much already in, in Japan. I think it's, that's happening in most industrial countries. Uh, and also renewable energy, is growing very fast in, in Japan too. Uh, but at this moment, still 80, more than 80% of the power come from fossil power plants in Japan. Mm. I'd, I'd like to ask you about the future of nuclear power. Um, mm -hmm. I've read about, uh, and not a, at all expert in, but the development of uh, small uh, nuclear generating devices. I don't know whether they were fusion or, or regular, but essentially small plants that would be floated in the ocean. And if they went critical, they would go down and, you know, there'd be, they'd be radioactive, but they wouldn't, um, you know, disseminate. Um, do you believe uh, that uh, given the climate crisis and everything else, but also the questions that we've been asking about the assumptions that Asher Miller spoke of about stable, you know, political systems and, and not wars. Do you believe that there is a viable future for nuclear power with either existing technologies or the new ones uh, for the future? Well, yes, small modular reactor, so-called. Yeah. country uh, under development uh, may have a future uh, because it is uh, considered to be inherently safe, which means that uh, uh, even without power, the reactor could be shut down very easily. I mean, cool down uh, mm -hmm. naturally. And uh, also some of the fuels, uh, uh, the melting point is much higher, so it will never uh, melt. And those ideas have been floating actually uh, after even after the Three Mile Island and after the Chernobyl accident, but unfortunately never be realized, and because of the basically because of the economics, but also safety regulation is very conservative. Nuclear safety regulation all over the world is very conservative, so uh, getting a license uh, of this new type of power plants takes some time. So I would say it might. But uh, uh, we are talking about climate change uh, action within next 10 years or even 20 years. And uh, even if small modular reactor come online successfully, I don't know how many small modular reactor come online within next 20 years. It's probably small contribution. Mm -hmm. So at the best, nuclear power could contribute to, to the climate change, but it's very limited. So I wouldn't count on the success of nuclear power to fight against climate change. And more likely, the economics of nuclear power, even for this small nuclear power, but actually small, smaller modular reactor could be more expensive. So uh, uh, economics of nuclear power is unfavorable 
uh, in the next 20 years or so. So I think for climate change, next 20 years is critical. So uh, uh, I am a nuclear engineer, so I, 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 I like to uh, see the contribution of nuclear power. But my reality, my, my observation, the reality that, that even the nuclear power contribution, even if it's the best, is limited. The share of nuclear power is declining. Uh, right now, it's only 10% of the global power production. And at the best, it remains the same, not increase. And so uh, I would say nuclear power's contribution is, could be limited. So let me begin to try to summarize some of the things I've heard and, and ask you. And by the way, I want to encourage anyone who has any last questions to please ask them because we're moving toward the end here. But um, I've heard you say that at this moment, uh, the danger of uh, some kind of nuclear incident of nuclear war, uh, but above all uh, of damage to uh, power plants in the Ukraine, uh, that the danger is more critical than it's been uh, for a very long time. Uh, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was the last time that you saw it this critical. Uh, that the, the danger of um, an accident uh, caused by the war in the Ukraine is very high and that the longer the war continues, the greater that risk will be. Yeah. And it looks like the war is gonna be with us for some time to come. Uh, that if there is a, uh, if there is a, a meltdown, um, that uh, the consequences both um, uh, of the actual radiation danger uh, and the fear and social uh, chaos that can come from this are very great. Um, that um, in your experience with Fukushima, that the fear and the end of social trust was at least as powerful as the actual medical consequences. Um, and that um, there is no evidence that any agency or anyone else is moving to um, safeguard the plants in the Ukraine uh, and that um, and that this is uh, at least for me I have to say because I've been watching the news carefully I would say this nuclear danger has been underestimated in terms of the, the media attention that we hear a lot about the bombings of hospitals and all kinds of terrible uh, things taking place but we certainly don't hear as much about the nuclear threat, which um, may well be one of the greatest threats of all. Am I hearing you correctly? Yes, that's basically what I'm trying to uh, give a message today. And uh, yeah. I am very concerned. Yeah. But, uh, but, but at the same time, I, try, I still have a hope that uh, uh, Russian's military forces are sane enough that uh, they will not cause any serious accident. And uh, so far, they have been trying to do that. I, I, they cut the power lines, but they are allowing them to restore the power lines again. And uh, uh, they sent uh, uh, Rosatom nuclear engineers to the plant to control the uh, nuclear power plant. So uh, I see some of the positive, uh, those signs. So. Uh, if they if they are intentionally trying to cause any serious accident, they could have done that already. So my concern is basically accidental, unintended uh, consequence of this war, and still that this remains very high. Stanley Wu asks, "What nuclear scenario does Dr. Suzuki think is most likely to happen? And what scenario concerns him the most?" I will not try to give any projection of uh, probability of the uh, scenario, but my concern is, as I said, it uh, unexpected event could lead to any serious nuclear accident or any serious, any uh, possible nuclear war. And that's my concern. And uh, uh, 
the best case is of course the end of war or at, at least to 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 make sure that the nuclear power plants are safe and uh, um, even if the war continues they agree to uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine agree to maintain the status of nuclear power or so that kind of thing is more positive scenarios mm -hmm. but even if they agreed the war is unpredictable that's my concern if something happened there's no way to control it and mm -hmm. that's my concern Robert Isaacson writes, California is still getting hit by Fukushima radiation and seawater <laughs> at alarmingly high uh, levels that will inevitably increase as the main bulk of polluted Pacific Ocean water reaches North America over the next two years. Sea mist carries and deposits these radioactive particles in land where they accumulate. Any thoughts? As I said, that the distribution of radioactive material is not the uh how to get uh equally it could reach somewhere uh with some concentration but uh, overall uh the the amount of material uh released to the to the environment is not huge compared with the chernobyl so i would say yes we are concerned about those so-called hot spot mm -hmm. and could 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 cause some of the uh, uh radioactive level high it mm -hmm. could uh it's go, going down of course gradually but already 11 years already passed so uh, i from now the declining of the radiation level is very very slow the first 10 years is go down very quickly and then slow very slow so current situation will continue for the next 20 years or so mm -hmm. for people who want to become active in um in this area in which you are so expert are there organizations uh, that you would recommend that we either support or engage with uh, your own institution included? Uh, how can people who want to join uh, the fight for a nuclear free future uh, act most effectively? Everybody. Everybody should raise a voice, mm -hmm. uh, not just experts. Uh, I keep telling that uh, uh, the newspaper media that uh, anyone can raise a voice and it could be heard by the Russians or uh, military forces eventually. And uh, I think it's very important for us right now to raise the uh, awareness of this nuclear risk mm -hmm. and make sure that the people, uh, I mean, the, the Russian citizens and uh, Russian military forces could hear the voices from the world. And this activity should not be allowed. Mm -hmm. And it has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And that's my, that's my message. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Joan Diamond and Stanley Wu to come back uh, online here. And Joan, uh, any last thoughts or reflections for Dr. Suzuki? This has been I think an extraordinary presentation. And uh, I think it will be viewed by a lot of our colleagues who weren't able to be here today. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Suzuki, and thank you very I look much. forward to further engagement. Yes. Uh, Joan, any thoughts or reflections? Only two. One, I wanna thank you very much for joining us and on such short notice. And secondly, I hope I can still feel the thankfulness when I'm lying awake at night. Yes. Stanley, last thoughts. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Joan. And most importantly, thank you, Dr. Suzuki. This is an extraordinary conversation. And I think most of us are leaving this with a deeper sense of how complicated these issues are. So we very much appreciate your time here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very Great much, again, Dr. Suzuki. Take care. Right. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, we will post a recording of this webinar on our website, omega.ngo and resilience.org. If you're interested in receiving more invitations like this, you can register on our website. And we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Please stay tuned. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, thank be positive. You. Be positive. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>